Read with me, if you will, John 18, verse 37. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king for this cause. Say this cause. I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I could bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Let's pray. Father, today in the next few moments, I pray that every person hearing this message, Lord God, that you would prick our hearts, that the passion for the cause of Christ would burn on the inside to everyone who's watching via the internet live right now. I pray, Lord God, that you would burn on the inside of every one of us the cause of Christ, that we would be willing to lay our lives down and re-examine our lives to get in line with the call of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, Jesus said it was for this cause that I was born. Listen, Jesus knew exactly why he came to planet Earth, and you and I can know the same. In fact, his cause was so vital, he was willing to die for it, willing to lay his life down. And you know, many of us uh, may take time to write down a vision and some goals for our lives and things like that, and that's good. I mean, no, it's good to have a vision and some goals for your life. Does anyone agree with that? No. Okay, yes, okay, yes. I didn't see any hands, but I, I didn't, so I wasn't sure. But it is good. But listen, if all we have is a bunch of goals and, and vision, unless we're lining it up with the cause, say the cause, the cause of Christ, there's one cause that you and I were born for, and it's really to preach the gospel with every fiber of our being, with, with everything that we do, with our gifts, with our time, with our treasure, with our talents. In fact, somebody once said, everyone who is born dies, but not everyone who dies has truly lived. And I believe that that's true. You know, and so many people spend their life, and many times just collecting money, collecting things, and working towards retirement, and then so many people retire only to find themselves mowing the lawn, fishing, and there's nothing wrong with that, but at some point, you kind of feel like, what was my life spent on? If you and I would work towards one cause, say one cause, which is the cause of Christ, then our vision and our goals for life would line up with the purpose that we were born. So many times we just think, well, you know, I think I'm going to plan this for my life and plan that for my life. But again, if it's not rooted in the cause of Christ, we are probably going to end up at the end of of life and be disappointed. In fact, Jesus said that there was a man who, who gained the world but lost his soul because his focus was on material things and how much we could acquire in this world. And listen, let me just say this. Listen carefully. If the purpose of Christ and the cause of the gospel is not at the center of our being, we will live a life like I just described. We'll, we'll accumulate wealth and we'll accumulate goals and we'll accumulate these things, but towards the end of life, it will seem empty. See, when Christ's cause truly underpins our life, we're going to discover the meaning and the purpose for our life and realize that you and I were born in this specific time in history for a reason. God doesn't make mistakes. We're where we are today, in this room today, we are here because God has ordained that we should be here today. Uh, You may be asking yourself, well, yeah, I want to know why I was born. Maybe you don't have boldness to fulfill the cause of Christ. Say one cause. And you may be wondering, why are you here? In fact, you, you may be here today and you think, boy, I can't even imagine God using me in a great way because of my past, because of my upbringing, uh, because of the choices that I've made in life. Uh, maybe you're here this morning and, and you're thinking, boy, I don't know if my life could ever get any better. Or maybe you've made a few mistakes like so many of us have. But listen, you were born because the Father has a plan for your life. Can I get an amen? See, he, his purpose transcends all of others' life factors. Uh, Greater than our limitations, our environment, the circumstances, the challenges that we face. In fact, before you were born, the Bible says that God knew you, destined you, and purposed you to be able to live in this time right now. Jeremiah 1.5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Sanctified means set apart. I ordained you a prophet to the nations, Psalm 139, 13. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. And so we see just from these two scriptures, and there's others, that God knew us even before we were a glimmer in our Father's eye. Come on, somebody. You were born for the cause of the king and his kingdom, 
And don't you let anybody tell you otherwise. In fact, you can look at Jesus' life, and so many times we look and say, yeah, you know, that was Jesus, and, and I'm not Jesus. And listen, we're not Jesus, but Jesus said greater things you'll do than me because I go to the Father and send Holy Spirit. We just talked about that in our last message. But even Jesus, if you look at Jesus just in natural terms, Jesus had everything he needed to fail. That may have shocked you that I said that, but think about it. Just think. Jesus was born to a teenage girl that wasn't even married when she conceived him. Joseph wasn't his biological father. (laughs) Let's think about this in just human terms. In fact, because Joseph wasn't his biological father, his real father had an unusual entity, God. Could you imagine playing on the playground saying, who's your father, God? Hey, God boy, who's your daddy? Could you imagine Jesus? Sometimes we don't think that Jesus actually lived a life just like you and I, but he did. And he faced persecution. In fact, from the day he was born, his mother was whisked away to a place that she had to give birth in a barn, if you will. I remember when I was younger, we'd run in and out of the house, and if we'd fail to close the door, my mother would say, what, were you born in a barn? Well, Jesus was, all right? So I can imagine, again, just play along with me, that he was ridiculed. Were you born in a barn, God man? And some of the things he would face. In fact, he was being persecuted by a paranoid king from the day that he was born. I mean, Jesus knew nothing but confrontation. Yes, there were blessings. Yes, there were miracles. But listen, when you think of Jesus' life growing up, And even beyond that, it's not your typical Christmas card. I mean, we get this Christmas idea of how neat and clean that stable was. But if you've ever been around a barn, come on, somebody. Not exactly usual circumstances. And on top of that, he had some pretty unusual prophecies to live up to. Isaiah 9, 6, it said that the government of the world would be upon his shoulders. Can you imagine that? Jesus is a young boy learning the word of God, knowing the call of God as the son of God in his life, hearing those words that the government's going to be upon my shoulders. Can you imagine he had to deal with, who's your daddy? What, were you born in a barn? See, Jesus, the Bible says, was tempted in all ways just like you and I. And so it's not a stretch of the imagination to really think the way we're talking this morning that Jesus had to encourage himself When you look at his past, when you look at his upbringing, when you look at the circumstances and the challenges that he faced, he had to continually go to the word of God and encourage himself, even as the Bible says that David did. In fact, Luke 6, 14, it says that Jesus would come and bring peace to all men, but you know that's not true. Everywhere Jesus went, there wasn't peace. In fact, many places he went, it was confrontation. He was constantly uh, being ridiculed. He was constantly being challenged. In fact, the Pharisees and the religious people of his day were angry at him that he would even consider himself the son of God. Persecuted everywhere he went, despised, rejected, mocked, condemned to death. Let's think about this. Betrayed by one of his closest friends. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like you've been betrayed by someone very close to you. Jesus knows what that feels like. Again, there's nothing that you and I are tempted with that Jesus didn't face. Now, he was without sin, so he didn't fall into sin like we all do from time to time. But he was tempted in like manner, just like you and I. In fact, I think he even faced greater challenge than most of us will ever face in our life. A friend of mine this week put a post on Facebook that uh, his son was healed. They had to rush him to emergency, and they thought he had some type of infection and come to find out his blood was good, and boy, God healed him over the course of just a couple of hours, and he put that on Facebook and was rejoicing and saying, oh, God healed my, my son, and of course, many people were rejoicing with that, but then some people started to say, how can you say God healed your son? How can you claim uh, uh, um, uh, power to be able to do that and just ridicule him? And, and, and he sent me a text, and he said, boy, just one post on Facebook, and Facebook blows up. And I, I, I texted him back, and I said, Jesus' life blew up a lot. Jesus went and he proclaimed things and they were like, say what? In fact, Jesus, so much of his life, people would follow him, but when it got right down to the nitty gritty, right down to the end, they all turned and ran. I mean, the disciples eventually came back, but boy, everybody else was like, we don't know about this guy. He started talking about, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood to enter the kingdom of God. And people are like, what are you talking about? They didn't understand it. 
But Jesus rose above every obstacle. He knew who he was and why he was created. And I'm here this morning to encourage you that you need to have a plan for your life that is centered around one cause, say one cause, and that cause is the plans and the purposes of God to preach the gospel through your life. Romans 12, 2, he says this. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I've heard many people take this scripture and say, don't be conformed to this world. You know, you got all that sin in your life. And even though that is a correct statement that we shouldn't live a life that's riddled with sin, how many agree with that? But I've seen people take this, really, this scripture out of context. He's saying don't be conformed. What does that mean? Conform means that you're going to be held back, that you can only do what you're told you can do at any one given time. He's saying don't be conformed, but be renewed that you can prove what the good and perfect acceptable will of God is. Why? Because everything in hell is going to try and stop you from believing God that you can fulfill your mission. So I'm warning you. That if you live with one purpose, if you live with one cause, the gates of hell are going to try to withstand you if you're going to continue to walk by faith. And you're going to have to fight the fight of faith. I'm not going to lie to you. But listen, you and I, if we continue to renew our minds and stay focused on the will of God, then we don't have to worry about letting our past dictate our future. We can realize that we were born for an awesome reason. We've got to change our perspective. I mean, some of us even start out good and then we run into a challenge and we think, well, maybe I never was called to ministry. Maybe my life never was called. Maybe I wasn't supposed to start this business. Maybe I wasn't supposed to leave that last job. Maybe I wasn't supposed to do this or to do that. Listen, if you are surrendered to one purpose, say one purpose, then let me assure you, if you continue to pursue God, that your life is going to take the course that God has for you. There will be challenges. There will be things that will make you question the call of God. But you and I have got to daily develop a new way of thinking and see ourselves the way God sees us. Can I get an amen? So listen, there is no richer reward to life than discovering God's purpose and following it and allowing it to fuel your vision and your direction for life. Never allow yourself to develop a wounded spirit. I mean, so many times we can start to internalize the challenges that we've faced. We start to internalize the times that people have disappointed us. And if you've been disappointed by someone recently, let me just say again, I know God knows how you feel. Jesus knows how you feel, and he wants to touch that and heal you this morning. But let me also say this, it's not the last time you're going to face that. You're going to face disappointment. You're going to face people that kind of just go in a different direction. And maybe, well, you know, people say, well, we're with you. Well, we're, we're, we're going to follow you. And, and it just doesn't work that way when push comes to shove. But we've got to focus on the King of kings and Lord of lords and the cause for which we were born. Don't allow the devil to make you focus on disappointment, discouragement, doubt, fear. Amen. When people maybe reject you, when people... Maybe don't say and do the things that they said they would do. Ephesians 1, 4, listen what he says. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Furthermore, verse 11, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance and makes everything work out according to his plan. There's no mistake about who you are and who you were destined to be in Christ. Say, in Christ. And this revelation will help you and I stay on course. No matter what comes against you, you've got to continually remind yourself that God chose me. Matter of fact, let's practice. Say, God chose me. Imagine yourself looking at the mirror tomorrow morning and brushing your teeth or combing your hair or shaving your head or combing your mustache. Oh, my goodness, if that isn't work, at least for me. Imagine looking in the mirror. Let's practice and say, I was chosen by God. Say, chosen by God. Me, chosen by God. And you and I should have that focus every day. Encourage ourselves because the devil wants you to look in the mirror and say, man, another day like this, another disappointment. Who's going to fail me today? Oh, God, why was I born? All these things, he wants us to start to verbalize those. Listen, that is not 
what God expects us to do. In fact, he's given us his word. We just read some of it to empower us to live a life on purpose for one cause. Say one cause. And that cause is to preach the gospel with every fiber of our being. And so many times we think, well, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a teacher. I'm not an evangelist with those five-fold ministry calls. And we, we narrow ministry down to that. But again, we've talked about that even in our last series, that the five-fold ministry gifts are given to equip the saints. Could you imagine if you live this way, you may say, okay, God, I believe you've gifted me to start a business, but what is the purpose and the cause for that business? I have the answer. It's the cause of Christ. Maybe God wants you to fund some orphanage somewhere. Maybe God wants you to fund and help a church, a local church. By the way, I believe in the local church. I hope you do too. It, the local church really is the answer for what the world's looking for. In fact, Brian Houston says this in one of his books. He says, Brian Houston, Hillsong's church. We believers become his hands and feet here on this planet. And our part in his eternal plan is both significant and a great honor. Significant and a great honor. Have you looked at your life lately and said, boy, my life has significance. My life has great honor. Why? Because of the one cause. Say one cause. And that's really that Jesus chose you and I to be his hands and feet. John 3, 16. Let's read it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves the world so much that he gave Jesus, and now he's challenged us, called us, even before we were in our mother's womb, and equipped us and gifted us to be able to be his hands and feet. He came to find us, to connect with us, and then to help us to connect with other people and to tell people the great news of the gospel. Matthew 4, 19, then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We've been talking on Wednesdays quite a bit about what it means to be a disciple. And listen, there are no second-rate Christians. We're all disciples. Understand that the 12 apostles were the apostles. All right, They were disciples, but there were other disciples as well. In fact, there's two disciples that aren't even named in the, in, the, in the gospel, talking about their walk to Emmaus. And they said they're just walking and talking. But they're disciples. There were many disciples. Listen, a Christian is a disciple. And so when we say yes to Jesus, Jesus says, I am going to make you fishers of men. And so when we live for one purpose, say one purpose, say, say one cause, then you and I realize that the place that I work, I'm there for a reason, and it's kind of like a big lake, and I'm supposed to start catching fish. Come on, somebody. You're there to catch fish. I'll never forget, I was just a Christian of maybe four or five years, and I really felt that God was calling me uh, to really, I don't think that's going to help, so don't worry, Aaron. I'll just keep using this. I felt that God was calling me into full-time ministry as a pastor. I, I was going to Bible school, and continuing to work my job and just pursuing God and, and letting him direct my life because I was surrendered to this, this one cause. And Trish and I knew that God had called us. We, we didn't know what that would look like 20 years ago, and I still don't know what it looks like half the time. Can, can I get an amen with that or a witness to that? But I remember that I was working a job that I had probably been there 16, 17 years and, and a real good job and had a retirement account and all that and probably could have worked there the rest of my life. And I felt like God was calling me to go do something else. And so I went and did that. And uh, kind of there was a little bit of pride, a little bit of arrogance that God had to work out of me. And God was always with me and all that. But a lot of the plan was just me. I'll just say that for time's sake. But God, just the way he does, corrected me and challenged me and helped me. And, and I remember I was in a place where things didn't work out the way I thought they would. In fact, my, my pay was cut significantly. My, my insurance benefits were taken completely away. We had three small children at the time. Again, 20 years ago, our oldest child was seven years old at the time. And so they were, two of them were still in diapers. And so I'm thinking, boy, I, my, my pay was cut. And I, I need to buy diapers and food and all these different things. And, and I had to pull myself out of Bible school. At least that was my plan. And, and God made a way for me to finish Bible school. And I remember I was at this place and everything seemed like it was just falling apart. It didn't, didn't look like I was going to be able to stay at that job. But I found out that there was many other people there that had faced the same types of circumstances. And I started a Bible study and had a Bible study every morning with just four or five young men. And I'll, I'll remember when I started doing that. Listen, 
God spoke to me in my, in, in my spirit, and he said, if you'll be faithful to pastor these people, you'll pastor more. Here's the thing. What is in front of you to do? So many times we just look at the place we work and we think, why am I here? What am I doing here? Oh, if I could only have this job or that job, if I could only be over here and maybe one day. But let me, let me ask you, how faithful are you with what you have right now? I've even had, when it comes to area finances, people say, well, one day, pastor, when we hit it big, well, you won't hit it big and start giving abundantly if you don't give abundantly with what you have. Because listen, giving abundantly of our lives has nothing to do with the amount of finances or time that we give. So many times we get caught up and we think, well, I'm the biggest giver in church, and you know, I, I do this and I do that, and I'm so and, and we can get ourselves so run down and so burnt out doing the wrong thing. Now I'm not suggesting that we should do nothing, because nothing is certainly the wrong thing. But so many times we can get so busy and, and, and we, we do all these things, but it wasn't for that cause that we were created. We were not doing what God told us to do with, with what we have. And I love Jesus when he called so many of his disciples. In fact, most of them recorded in the Bible. He said he called them to leave their life. Every one of them. We talked about this Wednesday. He said, well, does that mean God's calling us to sell everything? He may not be calling us to sell everything, but we have to be ready to. Am, am I willing to lay everything down for the cause of Christ? And, and we think, well, yeah, if I was a missionary. But listen, you are. You are to where you work, to the places that you frequent. This summer when we're on vacation, listen, we don't check out on God. We don't like leave our Christian clothes at church and then go live like the rest of the world all summer long, or do we? But see, we should be allowing God to use us in the one cause that we were created, even while we're vacationing, even while we're doing things and enjoying we're going to get more than one week of summer, I think, this year, so thank God for that. But Jesus said, if you follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Let's look at the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Look what he says. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, making disciples of all nations. I want to stop and think about that for a moment teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end. Listen, you and I are here on this planet to exemplify the life of Jesus. Your testimony, your conviction, your commitment to the cause of Christ is about ushering people into the kingdom, say kingdom, of heaven. See, the church, the ecclesia, is the called out ones. You want to switch this, I'm sure. I'll take that other mic. I'll just use that. Thank you. How's that? Okay. Well, that sounds a lot better. I now have a different voice. <laughs> Pastor Tony will be back next week. <laughs> but we're the called out ones. There, he's back. All right. The called out ones. Called out to live life in a way that attracts people to the gospel, that attracts people to Jesus. And in fact... <laughs> Here we are, we're just into June, and how many just love June bugs? They just fly into things. I don't, they fly into, and how about moths? Moths just fly to the light, don't they? But you know, our life is supposed to be like a light bulb. Jesus is the electricity. Hello, somebody. But we're the light bulb, and we, we should have all kinds of unsaved moths flying into us. Hello. But listen, if we're not, let me, let me assure you, listen carefully, listen. If we're not living our life with conviction, not going to happen. If we're somebody different throughout the week than we are on Sunday or Wednesday, if we're a really good Christian, if we're not letting our light shine, if we're not letting the bulb that we are be filled with the illumination of Jesus Christ, then we're not fulfilling this one cause. Say one cause. So many times, again, we just think it's for the pastor or the preacher or the evangelist or the teacher. No, it's for all of us who are called to be disciples. We're the beacon, the light bulb, so that others can see Christ. In fact, when you look at God's plan to preach the gospel, there's three dynamic factors in that plan. 
Number one is Jesus Christ. Jesus had to come, and and he had to be the sacrifice that would take care of sin and allow us to even serve him and to come into the kingdom ourselves. So Jesus Christ is the one dynamic factor. Number two is Holy Spirit. We just taught on that in our last series. And then number three is the church. Listen, Jesus and the Holy Spirit's not enough. He needs us. He needs us to say yes. Say yes. He needs us to live with conviction. He needs us to realize that our life is about one cause, and that's to preach the gospel. With every fiber of our being, with everything that God has given us to serve him with all that we are. See, I believe that a healthy, vibrant, life-giving, Bible-teaching church of worshipers in love with Jesus is the key to reaching the world with the message of the gospel. Again, I believe in the local church, and I thank God that we're part of the local church here in Traverse City. What part am I playing is the question that every one of us needs to answer between us and God. Matthew 16, 18, it says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. See, the local church connects people to the promise of eternal life. And so if you and I are not plugged into the local church, then we're not helping with the one cause, which is to preach the gospel. And, and, and I've said this before, and I think I touched on it last week when we brought new members in, but you can't love Jesus and not love the church. It's impossible. It, you really can't. Uh, it's, he, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. I, I've said this before. You can't. If you say, well, Pastor Tony, I like you, but I have a problem with your wife, well, then you and I aren't going to really hang out much. Well, it's the same thing with you. If you don't like the church, so many people think, well, you know, I don't need to connect with a local body. I don't really need to be part of that. that. That is just really not the truth. You and I are such a vital part of what God has planned, and the local church is the answer. Jesus loves his church, and he's committed to seeing her flourish. And you and I should be passionate about the local church as well. Let me just say this. The church is not about a bunch of buildings and programs and structures. It's about real people. It's about touching people where they live, a loving family, a community of people who love Jesus, who love one another, and are committed to fulfilling the cause that we were born for. We're committed to connecting with other human beings at whatever course of life they're on. That's why we say real people live in real life with a real God. Why? Because we want to be a church that welcomes people right where they are. Now listen, I believe that all of us are on our own spiritual journey, if you will. We're in different places in that journey. But we have to accept each other where we are and continue to look at the truth of the gospel, the truth of God's word, really is our compass, if you will, to help us all stay on track. But we've got to learn to accept people where they are. Real people live in real life. We're not faking it till we make it. We're just living life but trusting God. And then we have a real God who's got the answers. Listen, if we're not focused on Jesus, we're not going to see this happen. Oh, we may build a structure and we may even fill it with people from time to time. But if we don't take it personal and start to take it to the streets where we live, if we don't surrender to that one cause, say one cause, and allow our life and the visions and goals for our life to line up with that, we're not going to really accomplish what God's called us to do. You know, I've, I've talked about this before, but so much of what happens in church life is, is people just kind of bounce from one church body to the other. And, oh, yeah, people get saved in the process. Don't misunderstand me. But so few Christians live our lives this way in the culture that we're in. And what we've been trained to do is think, well, I go to this church or I I go to that church, and we think of a building and we think of a service on Sunday. But even though that's very important, don't misunderstand me, that's not the church. The church is how am I living my life Monday through Saturday in the sphere of influence that God has given me? Am I planted in the local church? Am I growing in the local church? Am I surrendered to the cause of Christ And what that means to me in the local church and serving where God has planted me. Psalm 92, verses 12 through 14 in the Amplified Bible says this. The uncompromisingly righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, be long-lived, stately, upright, useful, and fruitful. They shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon, majestic, stable, durable, and incorruptible. Planted, say planted. 
In the house of the Lord, they shall flourish in the courts of our God. Growing in grace, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Can I get an amen? (laughs) They shall be full of sap. Called somebody sappy last week when I read this scripture. Of spiritual vitality and rich in the verdure or trust, love, and contentment. And so listen, you and I, the key to flourishing our whole lives is being planted in the church, loving the church of Jesus Christ, being committed to the church of Jesus Christ, living my life as an example of Jesus Christ and an extension of the body. The Bible says, and we looked at it in our last series, of how every one of us is a different part of that body. And one part of the body can't say, I don't need you. I need Bob. Bob needs me. We need each other. And so we can't think that it doesn't matter the way we live our life. In fact, you show me a person who has lived their life successfully based on Christian principles and been successful towards the end of their life, I'll show you a person that has been committed to the local church, has been planted somewhere, and got behind the vision of that house. Let me just say this. The church is not here, the church of Jesus Christ, this church, any other church, to support your vision. Your vision should be surrendered to the vision of the church and ultimately to the one purpose, the one cause. So many times people say, well, you know, we, we just don't like it here and we, we're only here for a while and we're going to stay here for a while and we don't know about this and that. And, and, and we go from a church to church to church. But if we surrender to the cause and say, why was I created and why have you called me in this time, in this place, in this body? If we truly do that, we truly mean that, then we're going to live a life that the Bible says is vibrant, that is growing in grace, that is full of sap. (laughs) See, linking your life, vision, and purpose, and resources to God's church is going to transform your life. It's going to enable you to bring effectual change to your life and other people's lives. Let me ask you this morning, what is your vision for your life? I asked earlier if we had one. It seemed like most of us acknowledged that it was good to have a vision. But what is your vision for life? Proverbs 29, 18, or Proverbs, if you want to say it that way. (laughs) Proverbs 29, 18 says, who is that guy? All right. Where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint. And let me just say this. A vision without a cause is only a set of goals. A vision without a cause... But I believe that a vision that is attached to a divine cause, a divine purpose, will empower you and I to overcome any obstacles that life faces. See, so many times we may even have a set of goals. Again, we may have a vision for our life. But then if the church, a local body that maybe we visit, doesn't fit those goals, we look for something else. But that's not the way we should be living life. We should be surrendered to the cause, one cause, say one cause, which is to preach the gospel, say, okay, God, you've gifted me this way. You've brought me here. How do you want me to serve this local body and help fulfill the vision of that house? See, a divine vision will both give us a reason to run and something worth running after. It's going to direct our motivation, our relationships, our time, our talent, our thinking. I believe that when we live that way, then everything that our hands touch becomes a catalyst for something greater than ourselves. We start to realize that the decisions that I make affect other people. It's really easy if we just have a vision for our life that's like, well, you know, this, this body of believers isn't meeting my needs right now. And even though I realize that can be a challenge at times, rather than move, we say, okay, God, how can I help make a change? How can I enrich the life of that body rather than trying to find something else that might fit that need. See, I believe with all of my heart that a vision is something you possess, but a cause is something that possesses you. When when we're surrendered to a cause, you can't get away from it. I remember Trisha and I, we were first called into ministry and went to Bible school, came through some things, as I've already mentioned in this service, and finished up Bible school, and I remember there was an opportunity for us to lead worship at a brand new church plant. And of course, it was a brand new church, and I would still have to work another job, and so I wasn't going to be on paid staff. It was nothing like that. It was a volunteer position. And I remember God called us, and and we relocated our family. At the service they were ordaining that pastor, I turned to Trish, and I said, I think we're supposed to call 
that we're supposed to lead worship in that church. And she turned to me and said, okay. So we prayed about it, sold our house, sold everything we had that was extra, just enough to get in the truck and to move. We relocated, got another job, and on the way to that new location, in a snowstorm in the 1st of March, <laughs> my wife was in a head-on collision, and I was trying not to hit her in the truck following her. Everything we had was in that truck, and everything that wouldn't fit was in the van that she was driving, and ultimately all over the highway after the accident, including my guitar and list that I was to use for worship the very next day. The only vehicle that we owned destroyed, and I had to start a new job on Monday. How many know I might have questioned the cause of Christ? I mean, I remember my only prayer was, Jesus, my family! I mean, you can't think, I thank you, Lord, that you're my provider in all things. I mean, oh, boom, it's over. Sometimes you just need to cry out, <laughs> Jesus, say Jesus. Jesus. I love that song. And I remember getting my family all packed up and got them secure, and they were on their way to the hospital. And our daughter, Selena, it was her turn to ride in the bumpy truck, the kids called it, the big truck that had all of our belongings in it. And so she couldn't even see over the dashboard. She really didn't even know. I told her there had been an accident, but she didn't know what that meant at the time. She was only a few years old, and she was just a little, little. So we used to call them when they were little, little. And she's sitting there. I remember we were driving, and we drove just a, a mile or two, and it was a snowy, blustery, terrible day, and the clouds opened up and the sun came through as if God was saying, it's going to be all right. And I turned to her and I said, the devil thinks he's going to stop us, but he ain't going to, is he? And she looked at me and she said, uh-huh. And I, and I, but listen, it's times like that that you have got to know what your cause was. And then I remember we helped at that church for a number of years, and over the course of about six or seven years, the Lord opened up an opportunity for me to be on paid staff, and, and the church did some great things, and we, we, we built a building, and many people were coming, and, and we were preaching the gospel, and it was awesome. But I remember things just started to kind of fall apart, and, and maybe some things that weren't planned properly, and whatever, people can criticize, and there were lots of reasons, but nonetheless, the church started to kind of go south, and... The pastor had to resign, and ultimately I would lose my position as well. But I can remember staying there and having to tell this pastor that probably the best thing you'll, you can do for the church is to resign. And listen, that's not an easy thing to say to someone that you've been in the trenches with. But I knew it was the only thing we could do at that point. And so they brought a new pastor in. And, and so I helped with some of the transition as the executive administrative pastor and I can remember that we knew that we wouldn't be able to stay, and I tried to look for other work. In fact, Trisha will remember this. I just said to her, you know, six years leading worship, administrating a pastor in a church, um, I think I'm just going to go work a normal job. For me, normal, you know, something, what I was saying is I'm going to surrender. Because a normal job is whatever you're called to do, by the way. But I was kind of bailing on what God had called me to do. So I remember thinking, you know what, I'm just going to get a job. Matter of fact, I had a job. Oh, <laughs> I had a job ready for me in Escanaba. And I remember thinking, Escanaba by the moonlight. I'm going to go up there where nobody's there. Well, there's people there, obviously. But I thought, I'm going to get away from the busyness. I'm going to get away from ministry. Maybe I'll usher once or twice a month. Oh, I'll pay my tithe like a good Christian. But I don't know about this pastoring. Now, you may not be called a pastor, but you plug in your call. And if you're surrendered to the cause, you'll know what that is. If you're not surrendered to the cause, it may be the first time you've even thought this way. Maybe you're here today and you had some things go south and you thought, boy, it's not just me. Well, I'm here to assure you it's not just you. And everybody faces this stuff. And I can remember I had it all figured out. And my wife, being the humble prayer warrior that she is, knew otherwise. You want to see faith, see a wife that trusts her husband when she knows he might be doing the wrong thing, but she knows God's bigger than that mistake. And I'll show you a person of faith. Sometimes they're the quietest person in the room, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes the loudest person in the room is the weakest. 
I'll just leave that there for a moment. But I remember, I thought, man, that's it. And, 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 and Trish, she knew otherwise. And then a friend of mine said, hey, there's a church that needs a worship leader. You should go check it out. And I'm like, yeah, I'll check. I'm done. I, I thought I was done. Because I remember when I found out that things were just not going to work out at that particular church that I was at, the story I'm telling you. I remember I was just driving one day, and the pastor that was helping in the transition, you know, I just kind of broke down. I had to pull my car over because I couldn't stop crying because I felt like everything that I had put on the line was destroyed. My life was done. Maybe you're facing that this morning. I don't know. Chances are in life you will face something like that because especially if you're living this life we're talking about because the devil will try to keep it down. But listen, you can't lose hope if you're surrendered to one cause. Say one cause. And that cause is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I remember I said, well, okay, we'll go. And we'll, we'll go check out that church. I thought, we'll lead worship, because I like playing my guitar and leading worship. And then we'll go have a nice lunch with the pastor. And Escanaba, here I come. I can remember thinking clearly, that, that's it. It would just be fun. be a time to get away. So we went to this particular uh, little city called Ionia, just east of Grand Rapids. Maybe some of you know where it is. I remember going there. I grew up in Grand Rapids. I'm thinking, Ionia. There's cows in Ionia. What's in Ionia? Prisons. <laughs> like I said, we're just going to go there, have lunch. See ya. All right. So we went Saturday night, and we really just had a great time with the pastor and his wife and worshiped and talked and prayed together and had dinner and just enjoyed their company and then went and uh, stayed with Trisha's mother, who was living pretty close by there at the time, and got up early the next morning to go lead worship in this church. And I I'll never forget driving on our way to Ionia. As a matter of fact, we're just coming up M21, Fulton Avenue, heading towards, um, yeah, right before uh, Lowell, heading towards Lowell on our way to Ionia. I remember coming up over that, that road, and I'm just thinking, yeah, we're going to lead worship, and we're going to have lunch, and then I'm going to take that job in Escanaba. And as we started to come over that sunrise, or see the sunrise coming up over the the road we were driving on, God started to prick my heart. I'm not done with you yet. And, and listen, if you've never surrendered to the cause, then you may not even know what that feels like. But if you have surrendered to the cause, let me assure you, even if the, all of hell is breaking loose, it could be financial disaster, it could be relationships, it could be sickness. I don't, whatever you're facing, I can just share my story. And you feel like none of the promises of God will ever come to pass. Let me assure you, he's not done with you yet. Say one cause. When you surrender your life to Christ and you allow the vision for your life to line up with the vision that God has, I don't care how tough life gets. Oh, you may want to quit from time to time, but you'll realize there's something that's greater, say greater, than your own list of goals. We had a Wednesday night service. At the church we were leaving, the story I just told you about, my time was up there. Listed it with a realtor. He said, I'll get a sign up tomorrow. Went and worshiped and led worship that Wednesday night. When I got done, I had a voice message. Somebody already wants to look at your house. I didn't put a sign up yet. Yeah. Sold that house, bought another house. It was a house, mind you. I could go on and on. We bought it. I didn't want to buy that house for nothing. Again, some of the times the quietest people are the most faith-filled. Trish knew we were supposed to buy this house. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I hated that house. It was a manufactured home. I wanted a real stick-built house, you know, because my pride. I'm going to build a real house, you know. What about me? What about me? What about him? What about the one who's worthy? But we didn't want, I didn't want to buy that house. I'm not kidding you. Four years after we bought it, we, we made more money on that house than we've made on any house we've ever owned. <laughs> I remember thinking, they didn't even argue about the price. I'm like, what is this? Less than four days, we had sold a house, bought a house. We're moving for a lot less money than I was making, but it didn't matter, and God provided for us 
for a number of years, and the rest of the story, we'll have to wait for another time. <laughs> Say one cause. I'm going to have the worship team come back up here for just a moment. I want us to take just a couple of minutes as we wind down this morning. and I'm reminded of Jesus as he was being betrayed on that night before he suffered. And the Bible says that he prayed and he, like great drops of sweat, the blood just poured out because of the trial, the affliction, the weight that he was facing. And the gospel records this, Matthew 26. Again, a second time he went and he prayed saying, oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, you will be done. Listen carefully. Unless we surrender to the cause of Christ, we can't make a statement like this. Because when we surrender to the cause of Christ, we realize that His will may <laughs> cause us to have to surrender our will from time to time. Our life may not be as comfortable from time to time as we thought it should be. I'll switch so you can have this one. We may have to say no to our own desires. We may have to say no to the big vacation. We may have to say no to the comfort. We may have to realign our vision and say, oh, that's why you gifted me this way, so I can help establish the kingdom. Rather, I've seen so many times people start to get a hold of this and start to get involved in a local church and then God starts to bless them and they start to prosper in so many ways but then they forget what the cause is all about and they think it's about them and they start to spend more time on what that thing was that God brought into their life to help them to enrich the kingdom they start to spend more money on themselves and give less to the church and spend less time at church and before you know it 20 years down the road it's all about them again. Don't let that happen to you. Say one cause. And so Jesus prayed there that night, and he said, Not my will, but your will be done. And when we pray that way, we start to live a life that honors God. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.